Welcome to Lost Without Japan, a travel podcast about the life changing experiences of exploring Japan and those moments we would be lost without. For your listening pleasure, allow me to introduce your very own Kanko Gaido, Michael. Welcome to a special Lost Without Moments bonus introductory interview episode of the Lost Without Japan podcast. Our bi-weekly podcast is focused on getting you to Japan for your first visit or to make that next adventure to Japan better than your last visit. Today's special introductory interview episode is with the author and recent Kickstarter, Laura, and I'm going to, I'm going to try it. And if I'm wrong, you can tell me this is, we were talking about this before. Don't it was even yeah, that's right. Right. Uh, von <laughs> Aaron Donk Bach. Oh, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah, about it. Yeah. Pretty close. Yeah. Pretty close. Like go, 97% go about it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a passing. But why don't you go ahead? Um, you can go ahead. I know I said later on, you can introduce yourself. Why don't you do it now? <laughs> And then I'll just keep on going with our introduction. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Uh, hi, I'm Laura Van Aaron Donk Ba. I am an author and uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, Japanophile, um, nerd, all the things. So Great people, great people. And uh, Laura is kind enough to set aside some time with her Kickstarter and her being at hotels and doing, you know, different things for that. So we are going to uh, have a little bit of a different episode. You're going to realize this is coming out on a day that things don't come out on. Um, It comes out on a Monday, but this is going to be an extra episode. And it's going to be one that I wanted to get done because your Kickstarter is going on currently at this point in time. And later on... as we speak. Right now. I've already backed it. You can too. (laughs) Um, uh, it's, it's it, it's it. Um, but we're going to be sitting down closer to the release of your book uh, come summer, and we'll do more of that typical in-depth uh, talk about travels to Japan, your various series. You've done a lot, uh, your work with dogs, um, you know, so there's going to be so much to unpack at that point in time. But we're going to try to do touch upon a couple different things and get you back to relaxing and getting ready for tomorrow. So all listeners, just go ahead and sit back and enjoy this truly bonus episode of the Lost Without Japan podcast. This is your director of travel for TKIC Studio Productions coming to you with positive thoughts and excitement for your next journey to Japan and his own return sometime in summer 2024, possibly maybe 2024, November well, December, we'll see. Um, I'd like to thank you all for giving me a bit of your time today. And I truly hope that this podcast finds you in a good place on the path to a better one. Just whatever it can be at this point in time and moment, my belief is that this show could be a beacon for you in your lives. And Japan, along with that, could be that for you as well. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. If you're returning Lost Without Listener, thank you again for your time and returning once more. For today's show, let me introduce again, Laura. I must say, it's amazing how life can randomly introduce you to some truly wonderful and amazing people. You're being at, you know, Gen Con convention when I was there with my daughter and us kind of stumbling across each other me noticing one of your books at the time that looked like uh, Japan-ish, you know, type things going on and you introducing me to Susan. And now today, I'm fortunate enough to sit down with you and interview you um, on your series and things that you're doing. Welcome, Laura. Thank you so much for joining today, uh, the listeners of Lost Without Japan. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really delighted to be here. You know, we were having so much time. I remember, uh, I don't remember where I parked, but some some things I remember really well. My daughter and I were actually on our way to go play Harry Potter D&D. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it was fortunate. Uh, I, I feel, you know, we were able to meet that. So um, before we get going too much in today's episode, where could listeners go to take advantage of your services and to answer any additional questions they may have, because again, we're going to try to keep this brief today, either about your Kickstarter or other books you've written. 
Uh, you can find the hub for all the things at my website. That is lauravab.com, which is lauravictoralphabravo.com, because nobody wants to spell Laura Venar and Donkba. Probably not. Probably not. That's, that's a good call. <laughs> um, I'm going to include that and like your social media as well in our show notes for those of you that are listening and trying to spell, um, you know, that in your head as well. <laughs> uh, you know, just focus on the road. You'll be good. <laughs> um, um, yes. I wanted, though, before we get like too much into the Kickstarter, um, just to give you a little bit of time to kind of just introduce yourself. Um, anything you'd like to share, um, like a quick Japan interest, just anything that you would like to before we get uh, moving on? Yeah, so uh, I have a lot of fun because I'm involved in many different fields and I keep finding new ways to cross them over. So <laughs> my day job is an animal behavior. That's actually, uh, we, we've mentioned earlier, I'm recording from a hotel room and it's because I'm out of state teaching a, a behavior workshop right now. Uh, and then my last trip to Japan, I was also presenting on um, young dog and puppy socialization uh, behavior, uh, I guess, seminar there in Tokyo and then also running around and doing fun stuff. So Anytime I can find ways to get my chocolate dipped into my peanut butter, um, I'm going to to mix my favorite flavors and have a good time. Um, I think I just dated myself. I, how how many decades old are those commercials with you got my chocolate? Anyway, yeah, uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, she's old. It, it, like, um, at least we both get this. So it's, <laughs> the right, reference was not right. lost. <laughs> well, look, it's on YouTube. Okay, I'm sure you can find find it. What anyway, um, but. But yeah, so I, I'm a bit of a history nerd. Uh, I, you know, Japanese history is something that I really enjoy and um, have done some uh, presentations on and teaching teaching on. And you can catch that at Gen Con and such as well. And so then finding ways to, you know, hey, I'm going to go uh, walk around Japan and, and find some more cool stuff and do some more research. And I will also talk about puppies while I'm there because who doesn't want to talk about puppies <laughs> and, you know, great things like that. So, yeah. You know, when we finally have you talk about some puppies, uh, some more, that might be the first episode that my daughter actually listens to of mine. So I'll take it. I'll put it in front and say, hey, there's some puppy <laughs> talk in this, you know, maybe that will get yes. us. You know, maybe yes. that will get her. All the <laughs> so, puppies. All the puppies. Um, do you have anything? This is I, not on our list of questions, but uh, do you have anything when you get back to Japan that's like your one thing um, that you really look forward to or like that first thing you want to do when you arrive? Yeah. So, uh, so I have a trip scheduled for 2024. I'm very excited. Um, Susan, uh, Susan Spann, who you mentioned before, and I uh, have a joint venture for uh, hiking the Nakasendo. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, then I am, oh, I'm about to speak this aloud for possibly the first time. I don't know. I am considering an extra trip um, and actually going twice in yet one year, which is crazy, but I have some airline miles that I need to burn. So you know, why not? Uh, so I may make an additional uh, trip in the summer and uh, so then if, if that's the case, if that happens, um, uh, possibly another hike or, or climb or something like that. And um, so uh, so the other the other thing that I'm considering doing and uh, you know, no firm plans yet, but back in the day, there was a racehorse named Haru Urara. Uh, and have, have you heard of this horse? This I is have the, not. Okay, so um, jump and we're jumping back about twenty years, um, and uh, this is uh, she's she's affectionately known as the worst racehorse of all time. Uh, she lost everything badly. I don't mean coming in second lost. I mean badly lost, uh, and um, like over a hundred races badly lost. <laughs> so they just kept entering her, and however. She became such a, uh, I'm, I'm going to greatly shorten, you know, the, 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 the cultural legend here, but she became such a symbol of uh, just persistence, right? Like it doesn't matter. She's out there. She's running the race each time. Um, you know, the prime minister was talking about her as an example of persistence and, you know, someday she deserves to win. And that day never came up, spoiler, but, um, <laughs> and all this stuff, uh, she actually is credited with saving a local racetrack because she 
became, you know, it was really struggling um, financially, but she became such an icon. It's so many people, I mean, tens of thousands of people were, would line up to see her race, um, would bet on her. They're actually the, the betting tickets because she always lost and you, you know, Japan is built for puns, right? And, and so you could actually make a homophone pun with, um, with the, uh, losing a bet and, and I'm, I'm not remembering the Japanese at this, well enough at this point to commit to it uh, on, on recording. I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> that you could make a, a homophonic pun with losing a bet and protections. Her wager tickets actually became omamori. So people would get one and use it for protection um, <laughs> as because, uh, you know, with, I think, vehicle omamori. So she was famous and, and for being the worst racehorse of all time. And then she disappeared for a long time, you know, it got sold off or whatever. And nobody actually knew what happened to her. She was kind of just gone. And then a few years ago, resurfaced, somebody, you know, found her and donated her to a farm and you can actually visit her now. And so that's on my list of things to do is to go see Haru Rara, <laughs> the worst racehorse of all time. And um, I'm, I'm a horse girl. You know, again, I still work with animals, but I grew up with horses and I would just like to go and, you know, meet her. So that is amazing. Uh, I said, I love that. <laughs> It can't be more Japanophile than that. Like, come on, you know, it's a like whole trip, go see a horse. You know, yes, yes, I love it. Love right, it, love right. it. I mean, I'll probably also eat some really good ramen while I'm there. But you yes, know, yes, yes. yes. Uh, no, now we've kind of like at least a, a brief introduction going on. I do want to talk about your Kickstarter that is going on at this moment when it releases on Monday. Our episode for a little bit longer than that. Um, what can you tell me? about the uh the kitsune tales series yeah so the the kitsune T tales are a set of stories so far there are uh four titles this will be the fifth the one that's in the kickstarter uh and those are both long and short you know like one's novel length one's a novelette there's two short stories so it's actually very accessible even though the fifth book is coming out but they are set in kind of the Heian Kamakura transition era. So pre-Shogunate, uh, well, very beginning of the Shogunate, pre what everybody thinks of as, you know, the feudal era of Japan, the warring states, you know, all of that. Uh, it's just as the Shogunate is getting started, still all the Heian aesthetic, which is what I really wanted because, you know, Heian aesthetic. Um, <laughs> and but yeah, it is, uh, it, it follows our central character is an Omyoji who has been brought in in the first story to protect a uh, household from a kitsune, which is rumored to ne be nearby and possibly in the household. Uh, and, uh, you know, so the Shugo brings him in to protect his new bride and all of that. But how do you find a shapeshifter who may or may not even exist? And so that is, that is where we start. Um, it is uh, if you are into stories of yokai or just historical fantasy kind of thing, that's the kind of niche this is. So, well, look, what led you to choose Kickstarter as the route to publish your historical fantasy book, uh, Kitsune Kitsune uh, Tales: mm -hmm. Only the Dead Face North? Uh, yeah. So. I, this again. This <laughs> this is this is kind of a funny story. I'm I'm just going to tell on myself for a little bit. So I've been trying to uh, get up the courage to do a Kickstarter for a while. I've had a number of people telling me, you know, I need to be doing Kickstarter with uh, my fiction, and uh, I'm basically a coward <laughs> in some areas. I'm like, oh, you know, Kickstarter is where you very publicly hope throw a party and hope people come, and <laughs> you know, so. Uh, so I wanted to give myself uh, a bit of a starter project before I threw, you know, my, my, my next big fantasy series up there or something like that. And, um, a starter project, somebody suggested I do zine quest, which is, uh, Kickstarter's, uh, game zine focus in February. And I was like, Oh, zine quest sounds great. I love tabletop, but I don't, you know, I'm not a game writer. I, I'm not known in the game arena, uh, but it would be really fun to do a game in my, one of my story worlds. And this seemed like a really fun one to do it in. So I, the, the Kickstarter is a little bit different in that it is not just for the book. It is for the book and the game adventure scenario. Uh, and so you, you can either read the story as a normal book, or you can play the story as characters 
in that same story world. And they're corollary, they're corresponding, but they're not spoilers for each other. You're just in the same world, um, you know, chasing some of the same plot. So, uh, so anyway, that's, that's how we got there is this is, uh, this is me wanting to get into Kickstarter and wanting to do it in a way that, uh, you know, I wanted to, you know, the zine felt like a manageable project. And of course, uh, scope creep, I've never written, I've never spoke to done a manageable project in my life. Um, so I started with the zine quest and then my, my corresponding short, you know, novelette that was supposed to go the other half of the zine quest is rapidly expanding. And here we are. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it all. Love it all. Um, I know we've kind of touched upon, you know, some of this, but what historical events is this book based on? So there's there's two major parts because uh, the the time period of the story uh, takes place again. We're very close after the establishment of the shogunate. Where uh, so um, you know early early uh, 1200s. The backstory though takes place um, the back. You know they are pursuing a lost imperial treasure allegedly hidden by Kazan, who was a, a abdicated emperor in the 10th century. So, uh, I don't know. Do we have time for me to tell you a story? Go for good? it. Go for it. Why not? All right. <laughs> All right. Cause, cause, cause this is one of those things like, you know, truth is almost, is, is so much better than fiction because, you know, fiction has to make sense and fiction has to be plausible and truth is like, Oh no, let her rip. Let's go. So in 984, uh, Kazan ascended the chrysanthemum throne, became emperor Kazan. Uh, and he was 17 years old. So, you know, young has, has been raised for this, but, um, but, you know, obviously, you know, not a mature, uh, you know, incredibly confident individual. And he is very much pressured by, uh, by the court, particularly all the Fujiwara in the, uh, in the court, Fujiwara being the incredibly influential clan, um, involved in all levels of politics. And Fujiwara no, uh, Kaneye is the, is one of the ministers there who's putting a lot of pressure on him and not without reason because uh, he, he has a lot of political goals that neither of the uh, two favorite consorts of Kazan are a Kanae daughter, meaning, so he's not going to be automatically the regent of Kanae's next heir. Uh, but he gets his chance uh, a year later, one of the consorts, dies. Kazan's favorite, uh, favorite girlfriend dies. That is actually kind of his niece, but you know, it wasn't close enough. So too bad, you know, whatever. But he sees that now kind of is grieving. Uh, he's still feeling very pressured. He probably falls into what today we would call depression, he, but he's, he's, he's still trying to make the best of it. He's trying to be a good emperor. And he, um, begins, you know, studying the Buddhist scriptures more. He's trying to find, find peace there. And he's confiding in his cousin and uh, best friend, uh, Michikane, who is a minister in the court himself. He's a few years older than Kazan, and he really understands the pressures that are on him. And so when Kazan says, you know, hey, you know, wouldn't it be great to leave this all behind? I could, you know, just re live a religious life. And Michikane is like, yeah, yeah, you should consider that. Um, and, and he's like, well, maybe, maybe someday, you know, this is the Han era abdicating was pretty common for emperors once they reach a certain period for a variety of political reasons. It's like, well, maybe someday I will abdicate and become a monk. And Michikani is like, I, when you do that, I will absolutely go with you. We are such good friends. That would be the loyal thing for me to do for you as my sovereign. Let's go. And, and so, uh, Kazan actually starts considering this seriously. And, um, and a year later, in the middle of the night, they leave and he goes out to a nearby temple and uh, shaves his head and takes religion, like literally, literally leaves the imperial palace in the middle of the night, shaves his head and becomes a monk with Michikani there encouraging him. Um, and he, we are told that in route, he's, he's like, you know, as they're leaving the palace, he's like, well, is this hasty? Should we think this over? And Michikani is like, no, no, you're doing the right thing. You're absolutely doing the right thing. Also, um, the the Ichijo that the who, who will be the next emperor has already received the imperial regalia because they know you're leaving, so uh, so he's already got them the god's gifts that grants the divine right to rule. They're already with him, so there's no going back now. So Kazan's like, okay, so they go. He shaves his head. He becomes a monk, and um, a you know meets Michikane, who's joining 
religious orders with him, right? Except Michikani still got his hair and he's all tearfully explaining to Kazan, you know, I can't stay. I need to go and do one last filial visit to my parents before I separate relationships with them and, and become a monk. Um, but I'm just going to say goodbye to them and I will come right back. But the penny has kind of dropped because poor depressed teenage Kazan remembers at this point that Michikane is Fujiwara no Kaneye's third son. He's the one who sent the message to his two elder brothers and his father to take the imperial regalia and give them to Ichijo. He leaves the temple, joins the armed men his father had waiting as escort, goes back and now uh, Kaneye is regent of the next emperor who is seven years old. And yeah, so <laughs> this is this is it. And so Kazan spends the rest of his life as an itinerant monk, um, is actually credited with founding a religious pil pilgrimage. Uh, and that's anyway, so all of you, everything I just told you is recorded like that is history. Um, what I have then added to that is the allegation that a uh, critical, you know, very important piece of imperial treasury went missing about that time. And Kazan is t said to have hidden it along a pilgrimage route. And that is the kickoff for what happens 200 years later with the characters we are following. Love it. Love it. It, it is. It's like it's one of those like, don't worry, my, don't worry, my friend. We're, we're very close. I would never. <laughs> so. Right, right, right. I, and, and, you know, it's like, you have betrayed me. Oh, why would I do that? I will be right back. Never. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and, and you've gone into um, setting, uh, you know, where this is taking place. Things. Is there anything else that you'd like to add in that regard for the the book? Yeah, so uh, the the bulk of the story takes place among the Ko Kumo, uh, Kumano Road. I started to say Kumano Kodo, but that's what it's called now. Literally, the old road of Kumano. Back then, it was just the Kumano Road. It was not yet the old road. Um, but the Kumano Kodo has existed for over a thousand years. It is one of only two pilgrimage routes recognized by UNESCO, um, the other being the Camino de Santiago in Western Europe. And both of those are you know, ancient pilgrimage routes. And uh, and I had the opportunity in 2022 to hike the Kumano Kodo. I spent about a week through hiking uh, with Susan Spann. Um, and yeah, so that is uh, a pilgrimage that uh, trail. And there's like the, like the Camino de Santiago, there's several trails because you could approach it from a, multiple angles. But it visits the three primary Shinto shrines of the Kumano faith. And so those are the Kumano Sanzan. And uh, so in the story, that is, uh, there is a group that is hiking or you know, there's making that pilgrimage uh, and also searching for imperial treasure. Love it. Love it. Love it. Uh, as a uh, fellow, like, you know, D&D &D player with my biweekly group that's been running for like, I don't know, 10 years, something like that. More than that. Every other week. That's awesome. Uh, your, your stretch goals were one thing that definitely caught my eye. I saw, you know, Pathfinder, potentially D&D, &D, other RPG systems. What can you tell us about the stretch goals and just, um, you know, those add-on things yeah. that you could get. So the uh, the the adventure scenario itself is you know pretty much flexible for any system. You can adapt it. It's not written for just one rule set. And then the stretch goals were to provide uh, pre-made character sheets for different systems. So rather than having to start from scratch, you could have character sheets. The character sheets actually include art from old Japanese prints, not from Kamakura era Japanese prints from later but you know i did you know one those are that's the, the art style that we're actually more familiar with and kind of expect to see so you know we'll, we'll do it that way and and i just describe it as you're you're reading a later retelling of the original story with the with the art from a few centuries later but so we have uh we have those made those character sheets come with um possibly some personal missions that if you complete those missions. It affects the story for you. And you know, so things like that. Um, and as I speak, we are $16 short of our third stretch goal, which will have uh, both D&D, &D, uh, Fifth Ed, uh, Pathfinder 1 and 2, and Legend of Five Rings uh, char you know, character sheets for each of those systems uh, in the next $16. So there we go. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. 
So love it all. What can you actually, I know I kind of went about it backwards a little bit, but what can you tell me about your tiers that you have currently available for the Kickstarter campaign? And if any of them is exactly $16, I mean, that works too, but you know, what, what, what about the tiers that you have going I, up? I don't have anything at 16 exactly. I'm sorry. Um, I think there's a 15 and there might be a dollar. Okay. So you could put those together. Um, but yeah, because uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's a little bit different project in that we have a, you know, a fiction version and then a playable TTRPG version. Um, you know, not really versions, but but corollary stories. Uh, so you can get tiers that are just the ebook or the physical paperback, or you can just the the PDF or the physical zine, or both of them, or sets of all the Kitsune tales and the playable thing. So there's actually uh, a number, and they're numbered. They're numbered by number of tails. So you can buy three tail tier or the seven tail tier or the nine tail tier. So uh, all of those because, you know, Kitsune tails. There we go. Uh, so anyway, there are, um, I think, seven or eight tiers that you could kind of mix and match whatever combos you want. So I love it. I love it. Love it. How will shipping be handled for your Kickstarter? Yeah. So anything that's digital, um, I'm using book funnel to deliver. I've been using, I'm an author. I've been using book funnel for years to deliver, you know, eBooks, audiobooks, all of those. So anything that's digital will run through that book funnel has full tech support. So if you have any problems, you know, I got the ebook and I wanted to push it to my Kindle, but it's not going book funnel will fix that for you. They're great. So that's one of the reasons I love them. And then shipping for physical products, I'm actually shipping all over the world, which again, I've been doing for a while, so it's not a from scratch thing. So I feel pretty, pretty solid offering that as an option. I know one of my listeners already reached out when he saw my post and said that he um, backed as well. He's Australia. Uh, oh, so, so, so some excitement already. Some excitement already. Yay! Um, you know, I love it. Love it. And is there anything else before we get into like the Kickstarter end date and stuff like that? Um, that you'd like to share about this campaign that we haven't discussed to this point? I mean, if anybody has questions about it, reach out, ask me. And I actually had someone reach out a few days ago and say, hey, I really wanted a tier that did this. And I looked at it and I went, I wrote that tier down and forgot to put it on the website. So let me go back and <laughs> add that for you. Um, so, you know, please, please go ahead. And um, I mentioned it was my first Kickstarter, right? Okay, there we go. So, <laughs> so please, uh, you know, always feel free to ask questions. Um, you know, sometimes you're just catching, catching a mistake. And it wasn't that we never, it wasn't that we ever meant to, to prevent that. So <laughs> Like it, and when does your Kickstarter finish? Because this is going to be going live on the twelfth. Uh, what day does does it end? It will actually run a week after, so it will end I'm, on the twenty second. So uh, you know, that that's that's the final day, and we're we're pushing. I still have more stretch goals that are not announced, so keep it going. We're I'm ready for you. We got it. So. Love it. Super excited myself. Laura, thank you so much uh, just for setting aside time today. You brought a whole bunch with you to you know, record with me today. Uh, that was on our uh, Your Story, My Story Shared. Um, I so, so much appreciate it. Really, truly look forward to us being able to sit down and talk uh, in more depth just about Jan. Uh, you have so much. You could have your own podcast, uh, you, you know, it's, it's on, on just those historical things, I feel. Um, but before we part, uh, like once again, like where could listeners of Lost Without Japan uh, find and support you? Well, if you're going to be at Gen Con, I always run a couple of sessions called Story Time from Japanese History, which is where I tell things like the story I told here. So please check that out. Uh, and if you're going to miss me there, I'm so sorry. We can still make contact at my website, Laura, V A B, Victor Alpha Bravo. Uh, the newsletter there is very reliable, and you can find my social media there as well. Outstanding. Thank you again for joining us today. And just on behalf of Lost Without Japan and the entire crew, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for this introductory interview and Kickstarter, you know, hype machine, I hope. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on board again for our next regularly scheduled episode as we continue our discussion on Japan, travel, culture, and your lost without moments. To everyone out there, Oginki Day.
stay well, my friends.